Hello and welcome back to this edition of Buy This, Not That, Celestron Edition. I go through Celestron's long history and pick the models I think are worth buying, as well as the ones I think you should probably avoid. So let's get started. So Celestron's one of the giants in our hobby and needs certainly no introduction from me. The company was started, it is said, when founder Tom Johnson was searching for a telescope to buy for his son, but was dissatisfied with the models that were currently on the market. So he built his own. Later, he helped perfect a method for mass-producing Schmidt corrector plates at low cost, and the Schmidt Cassegrain was born. So the first model, 2i, is of course the C8. Of course, the C8 is Celestron, it's their classic model. The only real debate is, which version do you buy? Do you get the old ones, or do you get the new ones? You'll find a lot of debate. I don't think it really matters which version you get, as long as the sample that you buy is a good one. I think I have a mild preference for the new ones, simply because they're new. And there again, there were so many different versions of these, I can't possibly go through them all here. I did go through a list of all of the variations on the C8 on scope reviews. I will link that below. There are several different models, and I, you know, I think I even missed a couple of them, despite how long that article is. And by the way, the recommendation applies to all of the modern Celestron Schmidt Cassegrain sizes. The C5, the 6, the 8, the 9 and a quarter, the 11, and the 14. And in fact, with the exception of possibly the 6, each one of those has a legacy and a fan club of its own. The 5 went aboard the space shuttle Atlantis in the early 1990s. Boy, did Celestron get a lot of mileage out of that one advertising-wise. The 6, the only reason probably it doesn't have a big legacy right now is it hasn't been around long enough. The 8, of course, is the 8. That's the classic Celestron. The 9 and a quarter is probably my favorite Schmidt Cassegrain of all time. I have a separate video devoted just to that model. I remember when the 11 came out, the 11 was a sort of a miniature substitute for the C14 who didn't want to deal with the 14. And many people have a saying that the C11 is the C14 that you always wanted. And as for the 14, you know, what can I say? It's so iconic, so much personality, so much charm in a Schmidt Cassegrain, which is pretty rare. I had one of those once, it was too big for me and I sold it. Having said that, I kind of miss it. <laughs> Maybe I'll get one of those again another day and come up with a semi-permanent solution like a rolling dolly or something. If you're fortunate enough to have a permanent observatory, I'm jealous. Anyway, all the modern versions, again, recommended, you just pick the one that suits your lifestyle and your budget. For most people, the sweet spot is the C8. So in searching for models that I would not recommend, there actually haven't been that many. I think Celestron has done a pretty good job of staying in their lane. They know who they are. They're a Schmidt Cassegrain company, and they dabble in some of the other designs. When they've needed to fill in a gap in their product line, they have brand labeled or partnered with other manufacturers. I think for them, that's probably a good idea. But there are a couple of models that you might want to be aware of, and the first one is Celestron C90 Maxitovs from the early 1980s. I think they were trying to fill in the product line below the C5 with mixed results. These things don't have a very good reputation. I don't think the 0.965 inch eyepieces helped. There were at least three different versions. There was a telephoto lens, a spotting scope, and an astro version with a single-lighted sided swing arm and a motor drive base that was AC. You can recognize these because they focus by turning the barrel. Some of them were black and some of them were orange. It didn't help that these telescopes were around in the hyperinflationary early to mid-1980s. The Astro version at the time sold for $550. That's over $1,500 today in 2021 dollars. So again, these are telescopes that you probably want to avoid. Having said that, I do know that there are people out there who collect these things. Not necessarily because they're good, but because, you know, they're capturing nostalgia or because they're just a piece of our history. Here's a picture of a small collection from a club member who picks these things up. If you're eagle-eyed, you may be able to spot at the bottom that is a Coulter 4-inch collapsible Newtonian. Another telescope from that early 1980s era that wasn't that good. But anyway, very often you don't set out to collect these things. What happens is you're at an estate sale or you see one online and you pick one up and it doesn't cost very much. 
and then a short time later you're in a thrift shop or something and you see another one, the next thing you know, you got a collection. Not to be confused with the older versions, the new C90s, they're black, or at least the ones I've seen are black, are quite good. In fact, this model made my list of the top five underrated and overlooked telescopes. Seek those out much better than the older versions. So another example of a Celestron telescope to buy is Vixen branded high-end refractors, mainly from the 1990s. These can be hard to identify because they weren't really talking as to who was making what for whom, but there are a couple of models that are very desirable and they are both four inch apotype refractors. One is a C102ED with ED glass and even more desirable is the C102F, the fluorite version. If you can find one of those in good condition at a good price, you might wanna snap one of those up. There are people who feel today that those are some of the finest examples of four inch refractors ever made. And there are other models as well, too many to name here. One other one I want to mention is the GPC-102, that is the 4-inch F8.8 Acromat on a Great Polaris mount. Yes, it's an Acromat, but within that limitation, very desirable, very collectible telescopes. Again, if you can find one in good condition at a reasonable price, you might want to consider snapping that up. So another example of a Celestron telescope not to buy is 1980s era Halley's Comet Edition telescopes from Celestron. I don't know what happened here, but it seemed as though Celestron was intent on slapping the word comet on every crappy telescope in their lineup, and there were quite a few of these. There were some really bad Schmidt Newtonians and cheap refractors. This was bad on any number of fronts, not the least of which is the fact that by today's standards, Halley's Comet in the 1986 version was considered something of a minor bust. Seeing them through bad telescopes only made it worse, and in fact, Celestron today even acknowledges that they had overcommitted their resources on, on the idea of the Comet series refractors, and even overestimated public interest in astronomy after the disappearance of the Comet, to the point where the company began to have some financial trouble in the early 1990s. Those of you with long memories may recall there was actually a merger proposed between Celestron and Meade at the time. The United States government disallowed it on the grounds that it would form a monopoly. I think that was probably the right decision. Celestron and Meade were allowed to sort of find their own way and their own personalities afterwards. And it was also good for the consumer because they had more choices. Now, every once in a while, someone will point out a Comet series refractor from that era that isn't all that bad. It's usually a refractor of some kind. They're pretty rare, so I'm just gonna go ahead and paint this one with a broad brush and say, don't buy any Comet series refractors from the mid to late 1980s. Another example of a Celestron telescope not to buy are inexpensive scopes with the 0.965 inch eyepieces or visual backs. This is a standard recommendation for all brands, not just Celestron. You know, in researching this, I think my recollection is that there were more of these than there actually were. And I think my perception may have been skewed because of the number of cheap telescopes that people have brought to me over the years. So many of these had the first scope moniker. There actually weren't that many of them, but you do see them pop up on Craigslist and in thrift shops. Now, another example of a Celestron telescope to buy is Celestron Starhopper Dobsonians. Now, these weren't really remarkable in any way. They're on this list for one reason, and that's because when they do come up for sale, they do tend to be very cheap. So you can pick one of these things up for very little money, usually. Mid-1990s to mid-2000s, and they had a full line from four and a half inch all the way up to a giant 17 and a half inch version. I don't know what was going on here. They were uh, the designs were different. The four and a half inch is probably the least desirable of them. They had a single stock sort of mount on it. It wasn't very stable. The sixes and the eights were interesting. They had aluminum or sort of a metal side bearing system that was mounted on a rail. So you could slide the two back and forth to adjust for balance. Many Dob issues are balance issues and this is a clever way to sort of get around that. Once you got above the eight inch level, they, can, they converted back to a sort of a conventional arrangement. Confusing the matter even further, there were at least two different lines of these. The early ones tended to have sonotube, 
and the newer versions had aluminum tubes or metal tubes and they had this sort of a screw-in handle thing on the side. I actually like the old system better. I have the 12-inch newer version of the Starhopper right now. I don't think the altitude bearing system is all that great. Those little screw-in handles, they don't seem to ever have the right tension and they seem to poke you in the dark all the time. But anyway, they do come up for sale from time to time and they are quite attractively priced. People who like big telescopes are gonna be very happy with that 17 and a half inch. They're pretty rare, but again, when they come on the market, they are very cheap. I've seen those 17 and a half inch star hoppers and their spiritual cousins, the Mead 16 inch Starfinder Dobsonians, selling for less than the cost of an eight inch. And it's not that they're worth less than an eight inch, it's just that usually the scenario is somebody gets very ambitious and buys one of those things. They use it for a while and then it sits in the garage for a long time. 10 years or more is not uncommon until somebody, a significant other, comes along and says, get that thing out of here. And in fact, in our club recently, there have been at least two Mead 16-inch Starfighter Dobsonians that uh, have taken place at a transaction price of, of zero. That is, they gave them away. I'm not saying it's going to happen to you, but keep an eye out. If you like big dobs, if you don't mind hauling them around, keep an eye out. So another example of a Celestron product that I would say to buy is a mount, and that is the CG5 and AVX Duo. The AVX is the newer version. So a couple of caveats here. These are definite purpose computers. Computers glitch, they fail. Every once in a while, somebody will write me that they bought one of these and it just doesn't work at all. Yes, it happens. So the question is, do these things happen with the Celestrons any more or less than the other manufacturers? And having seen a lot of mounts now, I would have to say the answer is probably no. I think they're all about the same. You keep using them as they age, eventually something's gonna go a little bit screwy on you. I say, I've said this before, I, on my AVXs, I have to do a factory reset on them, you know, about once a year or so, and every once in a while I'll have to do a firmware update when something starts going a little bit uh, odd there with them. So that's one caveat. The other caveat is to watch the payload limit, keep it, uh, you know, reasonable. I've seen weight claims on the CG5, the CG5 here, uh, on the AVX of 30 to 35 pounds. I wouldn't go anywhere near it. Uh, I put a Takahashi FS-102 fully loaded on one of these. It weighs 14 to 15 pounds. That's probably about the most I'd want to see put on one of these things. A fully loaded C8, also about the same weight. Again, works very well on that mount. That's why you see so many C8s on CG5s and AVXs. The third thing is, there is a bit of a learning curve. If you're new to the hobby and you have to learn the night sky and you have to learn how to use a telescope and you have to learn how to see, Adding an operating system on top of it can be a little bit overwhelming, and I have seen cases even recently where people have dropped out of the hobby because they couldn't master the mount. So if you can get past those three things, the learning curve, keep the payload limit reasonable, and the fact that they will glitch every once in a while, the Celestron C5, CG5, and AVX right now are my favorite mid-class mounts. The operating system makes sense. They do a good job of keeping up with the firmware. One feature I really like on these is the ability to add, at least in my firmware versions, up to four additional calibration stars in addition to the two that you align to begin with, giving you, in essence, a six-star alignment. Things get very accurate when you have six stars. This is important if you're imaging something because eventually you're gonna be wanting to take an image of something that you can't see. You are dependent upon the computer. But again, a solid recommendation for these mounts. So staying with the theme of the mounts, an example of a Celestron mount not to buy is Celestron CGE. I have one of these, you've seen them in my videos. You know, it's based on the Lawsmandy G11. It even uses a lot of G11 parts. I've actually swapped parts between mine and a friend's G11 when he needed them. The Lawsmandy G11 is one of my favorite mounts of all time. So if the G11 is one of my favorite mounts and this thing uses a lot of the same parts, why am I saying stay away from this one? Well, if you own one of these, you know what I'm about to say. <laughs> so when customizing the CGE for Celestron Ease, they changed the cabling arrangement between the RA and the deck. Uh, I don't know why they didn't just use the Lozmandy 
right ascension and deck cablings, it was fine, but they use a sort of thick cables with the different kind of connectors. And mine has this thing called the runaway mount problem. This is a known issue and it is exactly the way I describe it. You'll be standing there and everything will be fine. And suddenly the mount will just start running away from you. This can be quite disconcerting if you're not prepared for it. But now it happens so much with mine that I actually sit there and I have to watch it. And I actually start expecting it. This is a real annoyance because if you think about it, I can never leave the telescope unattended on that mount. I can't go inside, I can't go visit somebody else. It may start running by itself and things can start running into other things and stuff can get damaged. Now there is a fix for this. Several amateurs have come up with their own independent fixes, but the one that's used the most often is what is referred to as the Gary Bennett mod. And what Gary has done is he has come up with a method for retrofitting the cables with this industrial sort of cabling system and the problem goes away. So why haven't I done this to mine? Well, if you look on Gary Bennett's website, depending on how much of it you want him to do for you, this mod can cost upwards of $500. Yes, that's for two cables. So right now I can't decide if I just want to go all in on this mount or if I want to just move on. Now I'm going to close with something that is neither a buy nor a not buy because I can't figure it out right now. And these are original Celestron schmidt cassegrains pre-orange tube. Now these were the white tube uh, ones with the blue accents. Ironically, the color scheme looks kind of like the Meads nowadays. But these were the original schmidt cassegrains before they settled on the modern versions. And they had weird apertures, at least for Celestron standards. There was a 10. There was a 16, there was a 22. So the reason I can't decide is these do come up for sale from time to time. They're pretty rare, but at least as of the time of filming right now, they don't seem to be going for that much money. So the demand is low, but the supply is low. So it's right now the prices are kind of reasonable. The question is, will these things become valuable in the future? And I just don't know. So that calls on you. So there you have it, a brief list of Celestron telescopes that I think you should buy, as well as the ones I think you should probably avoid. What do you think? Did I miss one in one category or another? Let us know. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.